Please help me welcome back to the stage filmmaker Toma Balmes. Thank you. That last image is perfect. That's how I feel. I just need to go <laughs> like this. Um, I'll take some questions from the audience, but I just wanted to start out talking a little bit about the craft of this film. I mean, it is so visually stunning and beautifully shot and so intimate. And if you could talk a little bit about the process of being there during these very intimate moments, as well as you know, getting access to this world uh, in the manner that you did. <coughs> well, um, well, the only thing is time, I would say. Um, and the fact that uh, I know him since he's very young. And um, he's calling me dad, uh, so we have a very close relationship. And, um, and uh, I was just spent um, over the next 10 years uh, a few hundred days there. And um, I had like some local team telling me in advance being very close from him, uh, what would happen about him doing this and that, so I could anticipate my trips, uh, allowing me not to be there full time. Um, but um, yeah, I think in terms of trust, he already saw the first film, so I think he trusted me on the on the result. And um, and um, I never had any problem uh, in terms of a relationship and in terms of trust. It just takes time, and you just need to be there and anticipate and. Uh, and, um, and be there at the right moment. And it's interesting to hear you say that he would call you dad. Yeah. Because what's so amazing here is there's so many moments where you just want to reach out and say, <laughs> don't you see what's happening or are you sure? And here I very much felt that you held your distance and you really let him make all of his choices the way he would make his choices. And can you talk a little bit about that relationship as a filmmaker of somebody who knows a subject, obviously, for so long, and how you did kind of maintain that restraint as the story unfolded. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's a kind of question which is you're always confronted, not only with this film, but in all of my previous films. Um, and um, I should never, I never feel like interfering. I did a film called Baby as a few years ago, and uh, the mother of the baby in Africa was asking me, shall I send her to school or not? And uh, I remember having this kind of discussion in France in dinners and people saying, this is insane, you have to, t she absolutely has to go to school and, and, uh, and this was absolutely not obvious at all. And, uh, and they were living such a happy life the way they were living, n not going to school that I didn't feel like. So it's, uh, it's something you learn film after film of not interfering, I would say, and, uh, and things uh, turn out the way they should and uh, they have to learn by themselves. It's uh, impossible for me to, to just tell him, don't do this, don't do that. He has to, to, to go through the process himself. Now he's asking me, what shall I do? Shall I stay in the monastery? He wants to be a filmmaker, so... Uh, <laughs> what do you say? I, I, just, I just let him decide by himself. Um, he's like uh, with all the monks um, that are doing kung fu films, uh, is very good, in fact, he's doing that with his mobile phone and he's a director and he's always the hero also. So he's uh, giving him the best role in every film he's directing. That's the amazing thing about documentary. If you had written that as a script in a fiction film, they'd say, no, that's just too unrealistic. But here it's really what life is. Yeah. And I had another question. It's one thing when people allow you to film their lives when things are clear and when you're young and when you're happy. And here there's so many moments that he's experiencing heartbreak and just genuine conflict. Were there moments where he might say, you know, this is a moment like don't, don't film or let's take a break? No, this is something very Western. Uh, it's uh, <laughs> never happened. Uh, no, he, 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 I think he just felt I was there all along and uh, he understood what I was doing, and uh, he just lived the things that he had to live. Has he seen the film? Yeah, of course. They all have seen the films. Uh, he didn't say that much. He just said, okay, good. <laughs> Incredible. Uh, let's take some questions from the audience. Raise your hand high, and I will repeat the question. Right here, yes. So the question is, when he went to film with the girl, did he know that you would be following the girl? Yeah. 
I told him, uh, I told him I would go there and follow the whole meeting and everything. But I didn't tell him anything about it. I just told him I would be there and following on both sides until they would meet. Right there. In the sense that we over, this is the second film I'm doing with him. There is another film which I've done uh, 10 years ago called Happiness, which was shown in the US on uh, PBS, on uh, Independent Lens. I think it's distributed still, you can find it. Um, and um, so we, we, we spent already a long time together and he already did the, the film, so he understood the whole process and the whole outcome there would be. He, yeah, he, underst he understood it was about, um, uh, the first film was supposed to be about, uh, in, in fact the first film was supposed to be this one, in the sense that uh, I decided to do the first film, uh, the TV was about to arrive in their village, and finally it took three years to arrive because of road construction problems and uh, and so everything was delayed. So the previous film is following him, expecting the arrival of television with the rest of the village. And you can see the whole community selling their yak uh, to buy TVs, to be ready when the TV, electricity will be arriving to, to, to be the first one to watch TV. So you have all the men sending one after another the yak and uh, going into Tibet to buy TVs to be ready when TV arrives. And the film finishes when TV arrives and they are watching full-time American wrestling, which was their favorite program, um, which still is. It's uh, very, very popular in uh, Bhutan. Um, and, um, and, and then I didn't really, co I couldn't observe the effect of these screens. So I just let a few years pass and I came back. And the first thing I saw when I came back is this image that you see in the monastery uh, of every single monk on their mobile phone. And then I thought maybe there is a new film to do. Yes. So the question is who pays for the mobile phones including the contracts? So, so I mean, basically, um, most of the people in Bhutan, they all have uh, mobile phones. This community is close from uh, uh, a community called uh, Layap who are the only ones in the country to be able to collect these cordyceps. And they are much more well, they used to be the poorer of the country and now they are the most wealthy of the whole country because of that. They can collect these uh, mushrooms, uh, which are worms which transform into mushrooms and they sell it to China for a fortune. Um, and because of that, the parents and the family have a lot of money so they can uh, buy very high tech uh, iPhones. And I'm curious, the monastery had such restraint, like you never actually see them say no cell phones. They just say study or play less or <laughs> come back. And I, I mean, I'm curious, is that by design that they want the monks in a way to have that experience and find their way back or do they not realize what's happening? So, uh, I mean, I think the head monks are among the most addicted to the mobile phones. Uh, uh, there was a scene in, even if it's not allowed, they are themselves uh, all the time playing uh, stupid games or on, on social network. <coughs> but they are, they are not supposed to. And the scene where you, you see them just playing by themselves, there were no headmaster around. If there is a headmaster, they, 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 they would put their phone in their pocket and they wouldn't do it. Because it's not really allowed to do it. But uh, so they, they do it in their rooms or they do it in the dorms. But um, if, if this moment, as soon as no one is there, they just take out their phones and just play. So uh, just the question is around the considerations for the lighting because often mm. it's either dark, there's no electricity, or mm. things are shot at night. Well, we used um, a very, very sensitive camera and very sensitive lenses. We never had any, any light. So.
So the question is about the sound design of the film. Uh, and I, I don't understand the question, uh, sorry. That there are some other sounds, Foley sounds, uh, that are not native to the picture. Uh, Foley sounds, you mean uh, music or like... Uh, Ah, yeah, yeah. No, we, we just um, we just uh, recorded everything on 5.1 and we came back to re-record. We had a specific trip on every location where we we shot to have a real... I really wanted the film to be uh, a sound experience, so we, we did a lot of work with the sound to, to, to recreate space. As, uh, as sometimes when I'm shooting, we don't have that many mics and it's not too... So we, we worked a lot on the sound more than any of my films. Because this is a film for theaters, so it's gonna, there are going to be theatrical releases in different places, hopefully in the US soon. So this is why there's a specific work on the sound. It paid off. I have to say, I was sitting right here in the middle, and you really felt yeah. completely immersed in the film. It's beautiful. We have time for one last question. Right there in the back. Short questions. <laughs> So the question is, how did he find this boy 10 years ago and cast him? And the second part is around language. How did he communicate? Did he use translators? So uh, I had like, uh, uh, very first time I had such a sophisticated translation system. I had like a kind of a ear plug and a translator who could translate live everything which was being said. Um, so this was a, thanks to the, the producers and uh, funders, we had a kind of uh, decent budget to produce this film. Participant, Arte, and a few other European partners allowed me really to take the time and uh, the means to do it well. And we had a very daily five people, not two, three, five people every night to translate everything which was said on uh, uh, subtitles to be able for me to really have a kind of super precise, be, beside the live translation, to have a, the rush totally translated before I, I would go back to France to be able to edit. Uh, and how I met the boy and found the boy. So at the very beginning of the process, I wanted to do a film about impact of screens and television and mobile phones worldwide. And uh, I thought of doing the film in the US at one stage. And then I decided n to do it in a place where there was no, no screen at all and the screen would arrive. And there are not that many places in the world and Bhutan is one of the only places. We didn't allow any screen until 1998. There was no internet, no TV, nothing. And then the king allowed all that <coughs> uh, because of the will of the people in Bhutan to watch the uh, World Cup of uh, football. And uh, so he allowed them to have TV. And this became the kind of decline of so many things with this arrival of TV. Uh, they opened up like jails, they're like uh, domestic violence, exploded uh, drug, and this is was totally, you could see the curve, totally like that. And inside of the country, there was very few places which didn't have electricity. And Laia was one of the few. And so I just walked there. We had to walk for two days to reach the village. After one day, of course, so it was a very long trip. And then when I arrived, immediately, uh, maybe the second day, I just saw this guy just jumping everywhere. And uh, you could not miss him. He was like uh, the only one like that in the whole village. And I just immediately felt like, OK, I have my character. Well, thank you all so much for coming. Thank you especially to Thomas for being here tonight. Thank you very much. Don't forget to vote. It's eligible for the Audience Award. Thank you so much. <laughs>